we have our Leaders in Mining Investment Panel, a uh, fantastic uh, collection of local investors uh, to talk you through some of their thoughts on the mining sector at the moment and some of the macro factors and otherwise uh, affecting the, the sector. I'd like to introduce them to come up on stage. We have Andrew Ballingall, who is the CIO and Director at Ballingall Investment Advisors. We have Jason Chang, co-founder and CEO and Managing Director of EMR Capital. We have Marcus Grimm, who is Director Finance Allied Strategic Resources, and Jorge Monroy, who is, Monroy, who is Founder and Managing Director of Emerging Markets Capital. Can I have a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> now, during the course of this session, uh, we'll be obviously taking questions from the audience. So if you, if you at any point want to ask a question, Take your hand up, we'll get a mic to you. Keep this nice and interactive. Uh, so if we could start things off, any questions? No? Good. Well, that was a test, okay. But in future, I might ask that, so I expect a few hands to go up, so uh, please do uh, think of some questions. But if we could start things off, you know, we're looking at the sort of starting off with the macro environment, okay. What are the big factors that are impacting the industry? And what do you think, in, over the course of the next year, what is going to be the most important macro factor impacting the industry? Jorge, you've grabbed the mic. You've volunteered to be our first contributor. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's already been a pretty wild uh, beginning of the year. Um, you know, it's about a month ago, I was, you know, we were in the middle of doing a uh, uh, financing for one of our portfolio companies and you know it was looking pretty grim in January and all of a sudden where I don't know if you remember early February the, the Fed made um, some comments that made gold and silver go up and then all of a sudden everybody wanted to be in gold and silver and then obviously the um, the bank incidents in the last month has uh, sort of changed um, Changed the pretty much everybody's a little bit on on edge. I, mean, I have two two comments. So I think in the in the one hand, you know, I keep saying conference after conference, just everything keeps looking better and better for precious metals. <laughs> you know, and it, it's actually surprising that that they're not uh, at a higher level. But the you know, in the in the other hand, um, the for, for the rest of the minerals, I think a lot of people talking about a commodity, um, you know, super cycle. I, I think I, I personally do agree with that. Um, the, there's it's just been a shortage of, of supply and, and I think all these dynamics, lack of exploration for so many years. I think that the one comment I would make is, you know, for mining companies, it's just incredibly difficult to operate, regardless of commodity prices, um, very difficult to operate in a context of high interest rates um, high cost of unemployment, of high em inflation, high cost of employment, lack of labor, and more than anything, just the for those companies that are public, the incredible volatility and uncertainty in the public markets just make it very, very challenging to operate. Mm. The the uncertainty in the, in the markets. I mean, obviously, the Fed seems to be changing their their, their mind quite a lot. Mar Marcus, you've got some thoughts, I think, on on. Uh, what they're doing wrong. Okay, good morning, everybody. Question, who likes ball sports? Your hands up, right? So we all have the same goal, bring the ball across the line. Okay. Now, the last seven years, what was the playground? It was, you know, solid ground. It was fairly easy to play. What has happened now? The turf has changed, completely changed. What do I mean? For seven years, we have had free money. Now, the question was, you know, what is changing? Actually, it's fairly clear because you don't have to talk about mining or biotech or any other asset class. This is pure, simple financial math 101. Interest rates have gone up and they will stay quite high. It's not necessarily the Fed policy rate, rather it's expected inflation. 
If you look German workers now, they basically go in a general strike asking for 10% higher salary. This, you know, will take together with central bank policies, normally 18 to 24 months to feed into the overall economy. What does it mean for asset prices? Of course, asset prices will have to be repriced. Short dated assets, meaning entities, regardless of industry, which make money now, obviously will be affected less than those with long dated cash flow stream or projected cash flow streams. So there are two components. One is of course the policy rate and the other one is the risk premium. So both actually have gone up. So now put in your model, instead of you know 5% discount rate, which was applied for many sectors till you know two years ago or even one year ago, you have to put in now 15%. It means many cash flows, distant cash flows, basically become worthless, okay? And that's what you now see in the banking sector. Actually, it's very simple math. Again, we are sitting on $700 billion of unrealized losses just on fixed income instrument. It's like playing poker. Somebody in this room has good hands and bad hands, right? But the good thing now is, and that's what this conference is about, to help, you know, companies in these times, which actually is quite predictable. So there will be winners and losers. Obviously those who have the management capability, and I would want to emphasize financial capability. It's not just to get money. Very disciplined financial managers who can, you know, steer through this new, or new coaches, I ask about sport, on how to play on this new turf which is very muddy, those will be winners because there will be much reduced supply. So that should lead to higher prices. So that is good for those who can deliver. But those who, you know, have projects which potentially deliver in 10 years, it's going to be very, very tough. But there's also hope for these guys. And that has to be in consolidation in much more disciplined, you know, uh, costs uh, management and so that's basically my introduction so the macro environment offers actually also opportunities and the micro management that really is up to good management and that is really the key you know I want to always emphasize when I have these very valuable one-to-ones it's not don't blame the macro environment it's quite predictable if you are in the lowest cost curve you always will make money. Mm. Okay. Jason, I mean, you, your views on the macro environment, but also as someone who, you know, runs, has a bunch of companies there looking to navigate the challenges, how do you see the year ahead? Thanks, Leo. Well, look, I agree with all the stuff that Marcus and Jorge just said. Terrific on interest rates, pressures. We like both. Both are very positive, I would say, for metals, mining, minerals, and we're seeing that from our investors, which is the large pension funds and endowments around the world. Uh, good news is for everyone in mining, um, you're going to see more allocation of capital into real assets and into mining. That's very, very positive. Long time coming, really. How, how come it's taken so long, Andrew? Too long. Um, but, but uh, we're going to see more of that, and that's good. And, and why, why do I say that, and why is that happening? Well, on the macro side, Leo, I defer to Economics 101, supply demand here. I mean, in terms of demand, if, we are, if the world is serious about energy transition, well, you know, there's only one answer, isn't it? It starts, starts with raw materials. Without that, you cannot transition. Now, the market hasn't priced that in yet, have they? I mean, we floated 29 metals last year at what? 5x EV EBITDA, that's depressing, really. Um, it, it's not dismal, but it's depressing. Uh, the Oz deal is transacting at, what, 10 times? So that's a bit more interesting. And, and, and the market, obviously, very short-term focus, and that's, that's why it's still mining real assets, producing EBITDA positive for generations versus tech companies with no semblance of profits trading at what, you know? Uh, so, so that's a bit of interesting stats, which I know is obvious to everyone, but 
my thesis very much is um, because the market's short term, uh, it hasn't priced in you know, beyond 12, 18 months of the demand coming from energy transition. I mean, so I think we've got enough stats from Woodmac and all those guys that you need how many million billions of dollars uh, to get into energy transition. I think the latest report was, well, you know, you need six Escondidas in the next 10 years, new Escondidas to fill the 6 million tons of copper under supply by 2032. Well, that's, to be honest, I think that's undercalling it, Leo, because the Woodmax of this world, uh, terrific research, but for those in mining, we know how freaking hard it is to um, produce two guidance every single year, every month, every quarter, every day. I mean, you know, um, I get a report every single day on all our minds, and it's never, it's, you know, it's never simple. So I think if you then factor in the sort of risk factor around guidance, then, then you need a lot more. So the market will catch up. It's not linear, but there's going to be a huge bump, upward bump in the terms of valuation. And we're seeing a bit of that over the last couple of years. You think about five years ago, what the consensus price was, gold, copper, met coal, potash. I mean, look, look at that trajectory, and it's still undercalling. So I'm, I'm very positive, uh, Leo, if you haven't picked that up, on, in terms of um, valuation. Uh, and that's driven by demand, right? So we, I, think, I think countries are serious about energy transition but the markets haven't priced it in yet. So that's one thematic. And of course, on the supply side, those of us in on the supply side, I think, uh, will understand it gets twice as hard just about every year. Uh, we were talking about OPEX earlier on, uh, per ton, per pound, per ounce. Uh, across our portfolio, we're seeing somewhere between 10 to 20% over the last 24 months, and that's um, natural, and we're seeing that in all sectors, really driven by what? Uh, COVID, uh, so the, the legacy of COVID is cost inflation and that will never return again, labor costs um, going up. It's unlikely to come back down quickly, we don't think. Power obviously had a spike, but that's going to come down, that's good. And, and technology will help us there across globally on reducing power costs per ton. So that's a good thing, but labor is the, really the major thing. And, and supply chain is hopefully um, going to be mitigated. But again, you know, some of the supply issues, given the geopolitics and bifurcation and polarization and all of that, will make supply much harder, right? Because whether it's Investment Canada Act or the IRA or whatever it is, all countries are trying to be self-sufficient. What does that mean? Well, it's not great for mankind or humankind, I should say. It's not good for the planet because we need more collaboration rather than bifurcation. But bifurcation will push cost up, will push commodity price higher. So you're gonna see that as well. So on, on the macro, uh, Leo, it's not great for the planet, but I think we're gonna see uptick in valuation uh, because higher demand, um, more effective, more rapid pricing, uh, and, and a lot more harder in supply. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in that answer, and, I, and I, will, I will come back to some of those points in a bit, but Andrew, your thoughts, optimism, pessimism for the, for the year ahead and the macro factors impacting that? I'm quite tempted to um, repeat my middle son's um, famous two-word reply to the headmaster of his school where he was packed off to prison at seven, uh, surrounded by ten very intelligent children, obviously much clever and better looking, poor and stronger than him. And the headmaster asked um, uh, Smith, uh, what do you think about uh, the French Revolution? He gave a perfect answer and he asked... Wang, what do you think about um, Scottish devolution and perfect answer? And then somebody else about the um, Virgil's Aeneid. And again, um, uh, Klashnikov, Kleftocraft, or whatever his name was, gave a perfect answer on Virgil. And the headmaster turned to my uh, second son, who's a canny chap, and he just looked at the headmaster and said, Sir, I concur. Anyway, um, everybody said everything I could possibly say about everything all of the time now, so... Um, I'm not going to win an Oscar trying to take that on. I, look, you asked about the next 12 months. Um, I'm going to leave out for now. We can come back to geopolitics because who knows? Um, but they are probably the key determinant, 12 months, 24, 36 months, because I think we're in the era of a really dramatic geopolitical change, and we're in the foothills of that. And secondly, I'm not going to talk about energy transition because that, as Mark has said, 15% discount rates, um, that's quite a long way out, and it's got to be paid for and all the rest. So um, 
I think it will have impacts, but, but not in terms of supply and demand, uh, other than supply and demand for companies, and we're seeing that already, this competition for strategic minerals, huge bid yesterday for a company nobody had ever heard of, uh, $4 billion. So I'd rather focus on the next 12 months, which are cyclical, um, and within that, obviously, the outlook for economies and uh, markets generally, specifically for uh, commodity prices and specifically for mining companies. I'm not going to talk about mining companies, because we'll come to that. Certainly talk about the impacts of commodities, but start with uh, economies and markets. And we've got three obvious big blocks around the world, um, most important for physical uh, materials still, um, China. Um, Europe's still a big chunk of change, uh, albeit uh, less obvious. And, and then you've got the US. And the US, it would seem to me, um, uh, the three things to say about that. One, um, the sharp rise in interest rates that's taken place to date in terms of policy rates is coming to a close. Uh, but as Marcus has um, astutely observed, that doesn't mean that money gets cheaper or more available. In fact, quite the opposite. We're now into second round effects where credit spreads go out and willingness to lend and willingness to borrow diminish, leading to feedback loops into employment, investment, demand on the economy, and it spirals down and round. So, um, my expectations, we've, we're in a bear market for U.S. equities, which has begun. We're having a, a pause of the refreshers at the moment, but it will resume at some point, I would assume, in the next two, three months. Um, and this time round, it'll be driven by uh, the reality of a of recession, which will take longer. There's a great Rudy Dornbush. I will say, just because something hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Rudy Dornbush put it much more eloquently, saying the economies and markets... Uh, things can take much longer than you think possible, and then they happen much faster than you could ever have dreamed of. And I suspect that's where the bad news comes in terms of the economy and profits, um, and therefore for risk assets, equity, credit, and real estate. But the difference, or one of the key differences this round, time round, I mean, it's, it's, it's vertical takeoff in what's terms happened to interest rate. So this is an amazing... We've had a plunge in money supply, which has never not driven a recession and normally severe financial crises. But it's taking place for the first time in a long time, uh, more like 19th century, where much more of what's going on is in private markets. It's in private equity, it's in private credit, and it's in real estate. If you're trading a treasury or an equity, you know, you're marked to market like that, something changes, the price changes. You, can, you have to face up to it. But in private markets, these things take a lot longer. So the delayed impact of this has yet to be seen. People saying, hang on, how come this hasn't happened? And it's a bit like the kind of like Thai, uh, when we had the tsunami, uh, suddenly everybody says, oh my goodness, the sea's gone out. Wow, look at the big great beach. Next thing, Whoa. And I think that's where we are. I, I don't want to say whether it's going to be bad or very bad, worse than normal. My expectation will be worse than normal. But anyway, I, I think the US is going to be a source of, of economic and financial market pain. Europe is always, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's posing as a, as a unity, it's clearly not. And within that, there's good and bad um, and strong and weak. But, but it's certainly not a strong union, and it's weakest in its, its fiscal. It's trying to make that better, but it can't make get better when France can't even sort out its pension system. And that precludes any real fiscal collaboration transfers. And that means that... The system is intrinsically weak, particularly in crises. So I expect another euro crisis, and it may or may not be reflected in the currency, but it will be reflected in the markets, particularly the financial system, financial companies within Europe. And Credit Suisse is, to some degree, um, a special case, but in some ways it's very representative of, of problems within Europe. Um, so I don't expect Europe to be a source of uh, offset to that. And as always, the ECB is the last to tighten. When the ECB is tighten, you normally know they've done it too late. And it's not just their fault, not just they're run by bureaucratic lawyers. It's just the batting order of where Europe comes in the global chain of events that they tend to end up getting maximum pressure to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. So I don't see that as much help. And I think the structural factors... Uh, there are commodity stories in Europe, the most important being gas, which is Europe's clearly got to turn on to US, particularly gas as a supplier and off from uh, Russia, and, and that's a, a big specific story. Uh, but I don't see it helping uh, demand. I think long-term, higher energy costs um, 
for Europe, which has lived, particularly Germany, industrial Europe, of very cheap gas. Uh, that's a, a long-term depressant for uh, industrial activity and, and the households, consumers in Europe. The interesting one is China, and it's interesting uh, because um, it's too early to tell. This is the famous Zhao Enlai story when um, uh, the French ambassador asked him in 1968 when the riots in Paris, it was a brilliant chapter, one of de Gaulle's bright young men called Père Fitte, Alain Père Fitte, a great, great book on China um, called The Ch Shock of Ch Civilizations. And it's to be read in either French or English, great translation. And uh, I think Alain Père Fitte asked Zhao Enlai, uh, Prime Minister of China, so, uh, Mr. Zhao, what do you think about the French Revolution? Zhao Enlai rather wittily replied, too early to tell. Um, but there is a debate whether he's actually talking about the French Revolution of 1789 or the French Revolution of 1968. Anyway, it's too early to tell in China. We've had this amazing sort of hiatus every which way. We've had a sort of pole reversal in, in policy. We've got a new team in. Um, uh, I think uh, there's only so much it can do. Uh, but it would be crazy to write it off now. My, my instincts is that the structural problems for China, which relate to the dominance of real estate within the economy and the financial system, is too great to allow any optimism in any medium, longer term view. But you can expect a pop from here. You're getting easier policy. You're getting friendly words. The trouble is the, the policy in China, which should have been radically restructuring, particularly the allocation of resources, human, financial, physical, and the economy from the point where Xi Jinping came in to improve efficiency and raise structural growth rate and productivity. It hasn't done that. It's tried to, but it's, it's proved impossible. And that means that the structural drag in combination with factors like global trade and demographics means it's going to be very hard for China to get any real oomph into that economy. I think the trend growth rate in China, it could well be 6% this year, but the trend growth rate is probably no more than 3 4%. Um, and, and within that, it'll be much less resource intensive than it has been in the past. But for now, it's a bit of an offset in that mix. So my expectation is, is we've seen, obviously, a big pop in, in the most cyclical commodity prices. Iron ore's gone up, it's almost doubled. You've seen copper. Um, uh, having been quite weak, bounce back, a combination of secular growth opportunities and secular relief. Um, oil has weakened, though, and I kind of take my cue on oil. I think we're probably past the best of the cyclical uptick. This kind of dead cat bounce in cyclical commodities we now should expect to see. And interesting, the Bloomberg Commodities Index I looked at this morning was at 104, pretty much where it was 15 and 20 years ago. It's been up, down had this amazing surge, I think an extraordinary one-off freak surge from, you know, was it 70 to 250 around the COVID ending. It's come all the way back, and I think it'll end up somewhere between 60 and 80. It might go down to 50, I don't know. So I think we're in a cyclical bear market for commodities, um, uh, which is going to pose a lot of challenges for commodity-producing companies. And that's where the, the, the astute points about management and financing and surviving that and it will throw up fantastic opportunities, but the, the only, I mean, if you, I don't want to talk about the, what I think are the, the bright spots in that. I think iron ore is in a secular bear market now. I think the equilibrium price for iron ore is probably 60, 70, 80, because basically the big China sucking is coming out, and supply in iron ore is easier than anything else, so long as you've got the capital and time. It can come on. It's going to come on. It's going to come on. do and elsewhere, get a resumption of resources. I think the other cyclical commodities, metals, copper, Nickel, they're in a they're in a cyclic. They're bound to get affected by the cyclical downturn. But there are secular factors, including difficulties with creating supply. We're going to get six escondidas. I'm old enough. I wrote a book on Rio Tinto in 1985. Uh, you know, get six escondidas. You know, it's like me having an up year. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Um, uh, but the, the the bright spots are the 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 ones that are connected to stress, which are um, uh, gold. And I see the stars aligning for gold. I think there's real asymmetry in precious metals now. The sort of best outcomes of the world, gold will go down, but not much. Uh, and on most other bad outcomes, gold will go up. And the other stressed commodity is, is uranium, which has gone up. But, I mean, uranium could easily be 25 to 100% higher. And it still wouldn't be really, you know, driving, incentivizing new supply. So it's an energy commodity. It can suffer a bit in a cyclical thing, but you know I think it's a good bet in a, anything other than the very shortest term.
Marcus, you look like you've got something to come back there to. Oh, Have a. Okay, a little anecdote. My best and um, job was ever I worked in Sandals op operational auditor. The interview was seven hour with you know lunch with alcohol. But why did I think I get a job? He was working as a 26 year old you know economist for the president of one of the world's largest companies. I was asked, you know, what's the most important thing? And my response was cost. And I worked for, you know, Sandoz, which is now Novartis. We were rigorous in cost, even the life-saving products. We had really products, it's binary. You take, you live, you don't, you die, okay? And we were rigorous in marketing, in production, even had to check the carton boxes, any country world. And, you know, all four of us, all of you in this room, is the question is who will survive in these turbulent times? It is those who manage the cost. If you're in the lowest quartile, be it uranium, gold, whatever, you're always going to make profit. You know, I, I worked for one year in the Middle East in Abu Dhabi. You know, do you think Atnok, Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation, of course, they, they want to be oil maybe 150. Okay, then the world will go into recession. But they produce at five when I was there at five dollars or now 10. They don't care, you see. And the other thing is, I think a lot of people, investors are fooled by the tagline. We are talking, you know, uranium and about China. It was in very much this room next to here, the Gazprom guys presented, you know, there was five, four or five years ago, Oh, we're going to build this pipeline for, you know, X $10 billion to the Chinese border. And I told these guys there, I was a bit more Russian friendly than today. I said, forget about getting the world market price. I guarantee you, once the pipeline is finished, and, you know, nothing against Chinese people, this is business, they will tell you, yes, but, you know, sorry, the price is half. And you're going to be, What? And, you know, don't be fooled by uranium prices you see on the, or, or what I make. Gold is the exception. Of course, you can bring it to the pavement and you get pretty much, you know, what the world market price is. Oil already before, you know, this, this uh, Ukraine uh, invasion by Russia is in the Wall Street Journal. The Indians buy Iranian oil for a third of the world market price. Don't be fooled by what you see on the screen. The market prices, the large you know, commodity trades are done at prices completely different, totally different, okay? So again, what is the way to survive? You've got to be the lowest cost producer. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> hmm. I mean, our, our panelists here have, have painted a fairly, um, you know, turbulent picture there of the year ahead, um, ch challenging markets. And as Marcus has suggested there, you know, you need to be, uh, it's only the best companies are going to survive. And those best companies are probably going to thrive as well, given the, the demands going forward. And if the marginal producers fall, fall by the wayside. When you're meeting companies, what are you looking for from those companies? Marcus has touched on it a little bit there. But Jorge, when you, when you go and have these these one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, what are you looking for in terms of, you know, the, the best management yeah, I mean, we're focused more on exploration, so it's going to be obviously different from everybody else here. But you know, the it, it's in many senses not too different from what uh, Marcus looked at. I think, uh, and again, specifically the public markets for exploration, you want something that has scale and grade, because you know, I think one thing that that. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're very much right. You know, if you look at the companies that have been uh, incredible stories on the, on the public markets over the last 20 years, I think those are two of the main uh, characteristics they, they share. You know, you, you, and, and they, they go through ups and downs and, and, you know, the process of going from a discovery to, uh, like, say, feasibility study to production is just getting harder and harder all the time. So you've got these... Um, you know, I was speaking about it yesterday. You get these two confluent forces. On the one hand, you know, every, and let's take 
gold out of the equation, but everything else pretty much is in the you know silver, copper, nickel, lithium, cobalt. Everybody wants more. Everyone wants to transition to electric. So in the one hand, you want uh, uh, more electrification, which means you need a lot more mining. But in the other hand, nobody wants to have a mine anywhere close to them. And you know, it, it used to be that uh, the, the case that that would be maybe if you, it'd be tough to build a mine in uh, in the U.S. in Canada in terms of permitting, uh, in maybe in Europe. But now nowadays, uh, pretty much everywhere in the world, uh, the, the permitting process, this emphasis on um, on ESG and, and environmental uh, care, which is obviously very important. Uh, but what that's doing is it's pushing the cycle further more. So now, you know, from discovery to production, it could take you 10, 15, 20 years. So, so then the, the project becomes very difficult to, to finance. Um, so, so going back to, to, to the question, really, you look at a project that's, that's big enough, high-grade enough, um, that it can be attractive to the capital markets over a long period of time. You know, if, if, you, if you have, uh, like just to, to give an example, in, in, in silver, if you have something that has, you know, uh, looks like it can have 100 million ounces of silver at, let's say, half a kilo per ton silver, it's going to make money uh, no matter what time, this, the, what, what price uh, silver, silver is at. And then you want to be in a jurisdiction that will allow you to take that discovery into production in a reasonable amount of time. Mm. You know, the U.S., uh, some, of, some of the permitting process in some of the U.S. states, you see these amazing assets in Arizona, in, um, in, um, in North Carolina, but, you know, you're, you're looking at 10, 15 years just to get an environmental permit. That's not a, something that, that's uh, sustainable for pretty much any type of investor except, like, maybe a, a family who has looking, you know, but like you know, private equity has a seven to ten year cycle. Um, you know, the markets it's a lot shorter than that. So I think those are the the main things, um, and, and I think it applies to across the spectrum, whether you're talking exploration, uh, development, um, and and production. I think the for me there was a big lesson during COVID, which was um, you know you I, I, I personally was a lot more willing to um, to consider what you would call exotic jurisdictions. Um, and I think, I think, you know, during COVID, at the end of the day, Australia, US, Canada, Mexico, you know, you could operate, uh, except for like maybe three, four, five weeks. Other than that, it, it, it was uh, business as usual. So uh, for me personally, yeah, unless it's, uh, you know, an amazing asset, <laughs> maybe stay within uh, sort of reasonable jurisdictions. Mm. Absolutely. Other panelists, um, Jason. I mean, you, you, your company's there. I mean, what are you doing to prepare for the cost inflation headwinds and things like that ahead? Yeah, co cost inflation uh, is certainly a, one of the big issues in mining. I said earlier on that across our portfolio, ten to twenty percent last twenty-four months. That's that's nuts, right? Mm. I mean, power we've seen go up 400% on one of our mines. Now it's come back down, so thankfully. So a few things we are thinking about. On the labor side, it's tough because in Australia, I suspect with many other countries, skill shortage is a major problem, not just in mining, but across all industries. So for that reason, it's not that simple to manage labor costs. Uh, and obviously, in Australia, you've got a lot of unions as with other, other countries. I mean, by the way, we are in about seven different countries today, uh, but a lot of our, we've got four mines in Australia. So uh, a major issue, I think uh, we are thinking about creative ways about aligning interests with, um, you know, contractors, staff. We want everyone to prosper alongside us. And there are other ways to give them skin in the game. You give them incentives, non-cash incentive to manage that. So we're all aligned in achieving the ultimate vision, right? We, we try to have people who are passionate about mining in our business, um, you know, we do hire 6,000 people, so not that simple to have everyone passionate. But, but we're thinking about different ways to incentivize employees beyond base salary, bonus, this and that, right? We have that anyway, long term, short term. Uh, on power, uh, we, we really need government to help us a little bit here. I think we all agree in this room, government have a role to play 
in infrastructure and in mining. And, and the Australian government, you know, thankfully, and as with many countries, are doing something to build the right infrastructure. We've got copper string. Having said that, copper string, what, uh, 10 times the over budget or something, five times? So um, that, that's taxpayers' money for, for a good cause, I should say. <laughs> Uh, so, and, and we're thinking pretty hard about, um, you know, going to renewables for our mines uh, rather than just off the grid. Uh, that long term will be very interesting, um, you know, and also we're trying to not just rely on governments. We're trying to do our own thing, solar farms. We're thinking about that. But these are all sort of five-year-plus type programs, not something you can just switch on overnight. Mm. Uh, in, in Kestrel, one of our metallurgical coal mines in Queensland, we are trying to capture the methane and, and um, sell energy back to the grid so we get carbon credits. We are trying to, you know, we are very focused on carbon management, carbon reduction. Uh, so that's key. And, and the third element, uh, Leo, which I'm sure you're going to touch on, is just technology. I mean, so if you look at grades today, whether it's gold, whether it's copper, you know where it's heading. Um, and I get the fact we want to mine in Mars, I get that, and that, that could be a longer-term solution. Um, that's okay, and we should all have aspirational dreams, but I think you look at the planet, uh, technology is going to be an, a very important key in unlocking more productivity, lower cost. So I think we need to invest in technology. We're thinking pretty hard about mine tech. Uh, that's interesting. There's some stuff out there which are very interesting. But we need everyone to collaborate. So my point about more collaboration, less conflict is a good thing for the planet. Uh, and, and it's not just motherhood here, right? Because this is a serious issue. If you're going to take this seriously, then we all have a role to play, uh, whether it's the investors, whether it's the miners, whether it's the politicians, to thinking about collaboration in technology. Um, because grades are coming down fast, right? Whether it's gold, silver, copper, going down. And permitting is harder, and rightly so. I, we agree with that. You've got to have more scrutiny on permitting. But if you look at our portfolio, we have three development assets we bought you know, eight years ago. It's taken a long time to get there. And when you get there, it's not final. right? Someone else has a say. Well, okay, that's all good. But, but somehow in there, we need certainty for investors. right? We need certainty for people, the staff. We need certainty for everyone. So I think somewhere in there, the regulatory framework is not quite under control. It's, it's out of control, right? So I think no one disagrees with um, more scrutiny, more governance, but, but then there need to be a system and people need to stick by it. You can't change the rules at the last minute because otherwise, why, why are the pension funds, why are the investors allocating capital to, to real assets? Right? They must all put it in something else. So I think we have a real issue to deal with here. So on the issue of volatility, I think there's a few impacts. I think I agree with Andrew. Um, it's going to be higher volatility, more uncertainty. Therefore, commodity price is going to go all over the place. Therefore, one of the things we are thinking, uh, we know for sure, you can't have as much gearing in your, in your mining operations. Less gearing. Hmm. And you've got to be very, very watchful about that. I mean, the compensating factor is, as I said, so I, I'll take a view that I think um, commodity valuations will be on the uptake over time, right? I mean, there's going to be more volatility. You're going to have some shocks. But the trend, I think, is, you know, has to be an uptake if you're serious about energy transition. I mean, talking about technology, um, do we need more edu uh, investor education about technology? Because if we do need technology to bring costs down and to, you know, to find higher grades and do the processing more efficiently and all that sort of stuff, when, you sp when miners tend to speak to investors and say, listen, I've got this great new technology that's going to improve my mine, most investors go, hang on, technology risk. I like to keep it simple. I like a simple heat bleach, you know, blah, 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 you know. How, what, what, what should miners, how do miners, what should miners do about that? Marcus, you know, are you happy with the technology? I'm fairly uh, optimistic. I track a lot of industries, particularly pharma. And there it's really, you know, the clinic which uh, interacts with, uh, with uh, the pharma companies. In mining, I mean, be assured, you know, ABB, GE, all these guys, they have their people in the field, you know, Olympus of how to analyze soil. 
So for the big companies, that interaction is really happening. It doesn't need government. There is a constant push and pull. Mm -hmm. So I'm fairly optimistic. It's really, at the end, the market which decides. And you saw in China, OK, no more money. Coffers are completely empty. Many Chinese, you know, I don't want to talk bad about, you know, our motherland, but the fact is most provinces are financially bankrupt, OK? So what did they announce? No more subsidies for e vehicles. Oh, OK, now people buy, you know, the old gas guzzlers, but actually they're improving so much. And of course, this is not um, salonfähig, we say in German, you know, it's not appropriate to say. But actually, from an environmental balance, many, you know, cars which consume traditional gasoline are over their lifespan more energy efficient, more less polluting than, you know, the EV vehicles, if you do the whole calculation. So let's be aware when we talk energy transition. This is a magic figure, about 3%, it's called of how much an economy can change. So when, you know, the environmentalists jump up and down, and I don't know, I, I, they have their reason and cause, absolutely. But let's be realistic, it will be decided by the market. And this, uh, you know, CO2 transition and neutral by, you know, 10 years or so, is completely illusionary. You see it in the travel industry, where actually the biggest gains come from is from Airbus, you know, producing new planes. The A350 is 40 tons lighter than a 777. That's where the efficiency comes from, not from, you know. And the other thing is, of course, this is completely prohibited topic, but the number one increase in CO2 is from demographic uh, population growth, okay? Africa will go from 1.2 billion to 2 billion people, okay? I mean, what did the Pope say on his flight? I'm just quoting here on his flight back from Manila to Rome. You know, I told my brothers and sisters, and I'm just quoting the Pope, I'm not a racist, to reproduce like rabbits, okay? That's what he said on the plane, okay? So this is the main contributor. And another thing about ESG is actually, and I was in the, one of the largest investor conferences in Zurich in last summer, and this figure popped up. And I want you to keep this in mind, this is very important. They're really the biggest pension funds in the world, cut towers there, Norway, everything. The S&P 500 index funds, the fees are about three basis points, maybe five. If it has an ESG label, it's 1.2%, okay? So this is a huge cost layer of the financial industry. The financial industry, and I mentioned this in a one-to-one -one with the vice governor of the central bank. I said, look, I work for Sandals and I know Nestle, all these guys. We did ESG for 30 years. Why should these bankers now on high street tell us my companies run environmental and social governance? They have no clue how a factory works. It's already being done. So this is a huge cost layer which the miners also have to cope with while in Australia, I would bet 99% of the miners, they're already ESG compliant, but another, you know, 1% on their cost. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very tempted. I think, I think the wave is breaking on this, this bubble, this nonsense. Um, I was going to set up a party in the UK called Green Sense, which is focusing on the, the real objectives rather than the rent-seeking and the bullshit and the nonsense around ESG. It's amazing when you talk ESG, and I've been forum with you know, leading um, accounting firms, with leading investment managers, uh, companies, uh, policy. Uh, you say ESG, they don't talk about governance. They don't talk about social. They don't even talk about the environment. They talk about carbon. That's all it's about. And, you know, take a country like the UK. We've done an amazing job on carbon reduction already. We're quite clearly into diminishing returns on that. It's certainly lost pr producing, not product, uh, prof productivity or profit enhancing for most people. 
People can't afford it. I mean, the, the great Jeff Curry, I famously cited at the uh, last one-to-one -one conference I was at, um, you know, he great, wrote a great piece called The Revenge of the Old Economy, tallying up the cost of this in financial terms we can't afford. We certainly can't afford World War Three and net zero in the next 15, 20 years. The technology is clearly, in most instances, suboptimal. We like producing all the cars for the 20th century with square wheels. I mean, they'll go forward, but we could do a lot better. We should be focusing on innovation. As Marcus said it should be mainly, you need some uh, catalyst kicks start money from governments to incentivize, we should be focusing on innovation, enhancement of technology, to get the optimal solutions for, for climate transition, not the ones that make a quick buck for the people who've propagated the scam on us. And finally, you know, just from a mining resources standpoint, we all know on this panel, everybody in this room knows we cannot possibly produce the raw materials required for net zero by 2020, 2035 on current technology. So it's just not going to happen. So we should get much more realistic. And I, I love Marcus as a very practical, I love the word salons fake. It's a word I haven't heard for a word uh, for a long time. Um, but it's, it's not terribly politically correct, but it's, it's practically very correct. Just let markets get on, come up with solutions, let companies keep beavering away, um, and stop you know, governments and, and financial scammers imposing costs on, on the general public. It's a huge, great rent-seeking exercise. It's not that it's not valid, it's a question of how we get there. Mm. Absolutely. Um, if I could move, go back, actually, before we do that, questions from the audience. Anybody got any burning issues that they would like to put to our panelists? I'd like, if you do, then set your hand up and I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, I'd like to go back to a, a point that uh, Jason uh, raised very early on, actually, about allocation of capital into real assets. Um, you said the pension funds are putting money back in. Uh, how is that, to sort of drill down into that, how are you seeing that coming into the, into the markets? Is it going into private equity? Is it going into equity funds? You know, is it going into directly into assets? You know, what, what's the, how's, that, how's that being funded, uh, funneled through? Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Leo. A number of ways. I think it's fair to say a lot of the private money I'm talking about, and I agree with Andrew that there's increasing growth for private capital, um, they're trying to figure it out. Uh, because private capital is relatively new to mining. Uh, they, they were very successful in oil and gas. Uh, they are transitioning away from oil and gas, and they are wondering whether mining is the next oil and gas which has done very well for the U.S. private capital in particular, right? That's like hundreds, thousands of private capital managers mm -hmm. in oil and gas. So there's actually a, a, a wall of capital there. Um, but I think it's fair to say mining's still new, even today. Uh, it's not a huge percentage of private capital that's going into mining, but the U.S. by far is the most sophisticated allocator of capital to real assets, and within real assets, They've got timber, ag, infra, real asset, real estate, and then mining is kind of part of that. So, you know, e EMR is focused on the mining allocation because it's an easier sell. Uh, and, and we do talk a lot of, to a lot of investors who are not into mining, and it's, you know, a huge education exercise. I think the optics on mining isn't great over the generations, right? They, the first thing that comes to mind for them is value destruction. So that's not that good. So you're, you're, we are starting from behind in terms of uh, managers of capital. But, but they are getting there, and I think energy transition has a bit of a catalyst. They're thinking, okay, energy transition, mining, maybe that makes sense. But, but energy transition is such a big term. It cuts across so many different things. So, so now there is a strategy within a lot of the private capital on what they call energy transition. Sometimes it's in real assets, sometimes it's outside the real asset and a separate basket, right? So, so they are trying to work it out, one, but I think um, there's going to be an increasing demand for uh, exposure to private capital focus on mining, so that's, that's good. Uh, some of them are going to public publics, but they're already there in publics largely, the public markets division of all these uh, big funds, whether it's sovereign or whether it's pension, whether it's endowments, whether it's fund of funds, they're kind of there anyway. So it's, it's kind of always been there. And the public market's very, very important, by the way, because sometimes uh, the public markets, it's, uh, it's a bit more savvy on mining. 
private is a bit less, but we're going to see we're going to see more. And then within mining, there's a question on: Do you go into private equity? Do you go into private credit? So you will see more private credit, especially given the events of the last two months. Uh, the, you know, you, you, you're going to see more interest, I think, in private credit generally, and some of that will, will go into mining. So I'm, I'm hopeful, um, given the thematic uh, in, in the midterm, that you're going to see uh, more of this uh, allocation uh, to mining per se. But what, there's lots of things that need to happen and the mining industry itself needs to, I think, be far more active in promoting success stories because it's very easy for people to focus on the, the destruction that's occurred, the over budget, you know, keep coming back to market for more money, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, a small mining uh, disaster can have an impact on the perception, but it'll take some time. But, but certainly we're, you know, trying to work with industry associations to try and um, better sell mining because I, I mentioned skills shortages, right? That's a major issue. Mm. Uh, and if you're a graduate today, I mean, uh, in the UK, I think uh, some of the unis have started closing the mining courses. That's not that good. Um, and, and you see that, you see that, you know, I mean, and you're thinking, well, hang on, that's, that's quite contradictory to what, what we're thinking about, you know, the, the world going forward, less carbon intensive. I mean, you still need more steel. Uh, it's not as if you can build a wind turbine currently without any steel. I mean, that might happen. Uh, and, and it, you know, humankind's very smart, and you, you, it will happen in time, but not, not quickly, right? And hydrogen's not going to take over tomorrow, is it? <laughs> Virtual wind turbines. Like my solution to the, um, uh, the cannabis and crypto uh, conjunction in Canada, I came up with this concept of bitweed, but it never took on, and I'm not sure about the virtual wind turbine either. Let me um, give you a little observation. Where do you think is on a lighter note, but to, in, to give you uh, some hint? Where do I see the most profitable copper mine in the world? Right here in Hong Kong. There is a recycling street down in Chunwan. You should see it. There are dozens of guys stripping up copper cables from their plastic. Few trucks every night leave. The guy who buys this, his margin must be a thousand percent, okay? And I think there's great hope in recycling when I see the waste here and when I see what these guys do down there. It's unbelievable the margin they must have with literally no investment, okay? That's great for them. Not so much for the industry, but we've got only two minutes left, and unfortunately, I mean, it's... Fantastic. Such a wide-ranging discussion there. Um, you know, we covered so many things we could go on for a long time. But I would, I'd like to sort of finish off with the usual question of sort of your commodity of the year as we look, at, as we look ahead. And you can go two years out, three years, or whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, let's just go down the line very quickly. Commodity of choice. I think, I think for me this year, hopefully, is a year of gold. I know... I, um, I don't know, uh, you know, it, it just thinks that everything is lining up. Um, so I, I, would, I, would, I would pick uh, gold. Okay. okay, Marcus. Water, because water drives most of the electricity in uh, my country in Switzerland. We have a drought. The land dams are not full. It affects North Italian farmers. Uh, it affects, you know, how the shipping on the Rhine River is being conducted. Um, it's uh, of really, really great impact and has a huge multiplication effect on the overall economy of uh, Europe and uh, probably also the United States if we look at the water shortage in California. In Could we Arizona. get a metal? Pardon me? Could we get a metal from you? No, I mean, there actually, this is for metal. Why is this relevant? We really, if you look at Israel, or also Singapore, where the water come from is reverse osmosis, okay? Requires a lot of special metals and also polymers. So in that, you know, we're talking rare earths. The solution really is to be, first, where does the energy come from? In Israel, I think they have done this. You collect the energy from the sun, and then, you know, you create the water from the ocean. And so this is actually a very, very big part uh, of, you know, sustainability. 
and is quite a big impact, of course, for energy production, as well as actually, you know, producing the solar panels and uh, the water purification plants for farmers for irrigation. I think it's really, you know, a, a key ingredient. I mean, that's the key ingredient, yeah. Jason? Uh, our pick would be copper and gold. Um, and if it's only one, then we would go with copper. Uh, really driven by, well, it's a well-known quantity, uh, it's got multi-use, It's there's no single substitute for copper, um, and again, you need copper in uh, energy transition and uh, supplies getting harder. So so that would be uh, our thinking. I think you're going to see um, copper being uh, re-rated uh, over time. Fantastic. And Andrew? Well, I'm delighted by Mark's suggestion of water because I spend quite a lot of my life on the west coast of Scotland and own quite a few locks full of nice fresh water and they're regularly replenished with sort of Assam-style rainfall. Yep. Uh, so I hope you're right, Marcus, and I'll be getting tankers offshore to ship it round to you wherever you are. Uh, but I'm, I have to say, you know, how can it not be gold? And if it's gold, it can't be gold. It's got to be silver, obviously, you know, because it's the leopard play on gold. But so I'll say silver. Silver, gold, copper, water, with some rare earths in there. Excellent. Well, thank you very much to our panellists. Wonderful panel to start things off.